July 22nd. There would be very talented people, very brilliant people, and it's all going to work out, and it is working out. So with that, I'll take a few questions, please. Yeah, please. Mr. President, I just want to ask you a question about the surge of federal agents. So with that, I'll take a few questions, please. Yeah, please. Mr. President, I just want to ask you a question about the surge of federal agents to various cities. Yeah. The mayor of Chicago just said moments ago that you're doing this to divert attention from your failures on coronavirus. You are only targeting well, cities. We haven't had that failure. You are only targeting cities that are run by Democrats. Is this just a political stunt? Yeah, the cities, unfortunately, that are in trouble are all run by Democrats. You have uh, radical left Democrats running cities like Chicago and so many others that we just had a news conference. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is. I mean, uh, that's the facts. Uh, when you look at Chicago and you look at the job, uh, Mayor Lightfoot sent me a letter yesterday. And I think in their own way, they want us to go in. There'll be a time where they're going to want us to go in full blast. But right now, we're sending extra people to help. We're arresting a lot of people that have been very bad. As far as the coronavirus, as you say, uh, I think we've done some amazing things. And I think you'll probably see that if you compare our statistics to other countries. And uh, if you look at uh, death rates, et cetera, you're going to see, and especially into the future with what's happening, you're going to see some very, very uh, impressive numbers for the United States. John, please. Mr. President, do you plan to do a national strategy to help uh, schools reopen and reopen safely? And regarding the children in your family, your son, your grandchildren, are you comfortable? Do you plan to have them back in person, in school? Yeah, well, well, I am comfortable with that. And we do have a national strategy, but as you know, ultimately it's up to the governors of the states. I think most governors, many governors, want these schools to open. I would like to see the schools open, especially when you see statistics like this. We have great statistics and on young people and on safety. So we would like to see schools open. We want to see the economy open. Uh, we just had a report, literally as I walked in, that we set an all-time record on housing price increases uh, up. I think they said 21 percent, which is a record that's never happened before. That's a great sign. We have a, an economy that's going to be booming. It's going to be a lot of jobs are being produced. The job numbers will be coming out shortly, meaning over the next week or so. And I think it'll be a continuation of the last two months. The last two months have been incredible. Uh, so I think we're going to have a good announced just before the election. They'll be announced around November 1st. So uh, yeah, I would like to see the schools open open 100% and we'll do it safely, we'll do it carefully. But when you look at the statistics I just read having to do with children and, and safety, uh, they're very impressive. They have very strong immune systems. But, but, but you would understand yes. that the children who go to school then go back to home, they're with, some live with their grandparents, sure. that there's, there's a real risk. Would you understand if some well, they schools... they do say that uh, they don't transmit very easily, and a lot of people are saying they don't transmit, and we're looking at that, we're studying John very hard, that particular subject, uh, that they don't bring it home with them. Now, uh, they don't catch it easily, they don't bring it home easily, and if they do catch it, they get better fast. We're looking at that fact, that is a factor, and we're looking at that very strongly. We'll be reporting about that over the next week. Please. Mr. President, uh, at least three uh, governors today came out with new uh, orders on uh, mask requirements. Yeah. Is that something you wish uh, all the governors would do? Well, a lot of the governors, uh, they have different requirements. Uh, some of the governors are very strong on masks, others aren't. Uh, I think it's really going to ultimately be up to them. We've given them the facts. We've given them everything we know. They have their own facts. Some are strong on masks, and as you know, some aren't in the same ballpark. But I think, well, I think all are suggesting if you want to wear a mask, you wear it. I bring one. I have one. I've worn it. Uh, and I think when I'm in certain settings, like hospitals and various, or when I'm close, when you, know, when you can't socially distance, I believe in it. Let's see, do I? I do. I have it, and if, if you know, in certain in certain instances, I think you really, uh, I think you want to travel with a mask. There are instances where you really can use it. I, I would believe it would be a good thing. Uh, yeah, sir. Sure. One just follow up. Uh, DC Mayor Bowser came out with such an order today. It of course doesn't apply to federal properties, but would you encourage uh, federal properties and including the White House complex to follow the order? 
Uh, we're going we're gonna to make a decision over the next uh, 24 hours. We'll let you know what that decision is. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Please. President Trump, do you agree with Senate Republicans discussing the possibility of extending short-term unemployment insurance today um, so that uh, they prevent benefits from expiring? Well, I think a lot of uh, politicians are discussing that, Republicans, Democrats. And right now, a lot of my representatives are on the Hill. They're discussing uh, CARES Act or Phase 4, whatever you want to call it. And I think ultimately something good will come out of it. The economy is starting to really come back strongly when you look at the numbers, even with the fact that, like, California is still closed up in many big states. I think the numbers are even more impressive, considering that some states, like California, big ones, are pretty well shut down. So uh, we expect to have something over a period of time, over the appropriate period of time. Thank you very much. These two questions are with uh, Andrew Feinberg and J.C. Buell. One is, today you said you're sending federal law enforcement uh, officers to run cities run by extreme politicians, that's the word you used, which, who happen to be all Democrats, who have supported Black Lives Matter protests. Many I didn't say, I didn't say who supported. No, I said Democrat politicians, and uh, these are the cities where you have the problem. If you look at Chicago, if you look at Detroit, if you look, I mean, look around any of these cities where we have the problems, and we're sending them help, but we're really waiting for them to call for the big help, for the big numbers, for the large numbers of people that we have ready, willing, and able. You look at Chicago, where 14 people were shot yesterday, where over the weekend, many people died and many people were shot, and over the last month, they're setting record numbers. Uh, we are waiting for the mayor, respectfully, and other mayors and governors to call us. We are ready, willing, and able to go in there with great force. Now, we also have people that are going in and arresting drug dealers, arresting some of the shooters that are doing the shooting. We know who they are. We're working with police forces, and even though in some cases they're told don't work with the federal government, the police forces have great respect for the federal government, what we do. But we're ready, willing, and able to go into these cities that are just being decimated with shooting, and we're going to help. Please. I have a question on crime, but first, I don't think we really got an explanation yesterday on why the health experts are joining you at these briefings. Can, can you explain why? Because they're briefing me. I'm meeting them. I just spoke to Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. Burks is right outside. And uh, they're giving me all of uh, everything they know as of, uh, as of this point in time. And Probably a very uh, concise way of doing it. It seems to be working out very well. Okay, so on crime. But they're very much, they're very much involved. They're very much. Uh, with the relationships are all very good, all very good. The relationships that we have with the doctors, with everybody working on the virus, has been, I think, extraordinary. Kaylee's here, and I think you would say the same thing. You work with them all the time. Yeah, go ahead. But. So on in 2016, you said it was President Obama's fault that homicides were up in Chicago. So why was it the president's fault then, but it's not your fault now? Uh, Chicago is a disaster. The mayor is saying, don't come in. The mayor is telling us not to come in. At some point, we can void that if we have to, but we and we may have to at some, because it's out of control. I assume she's saying that for political reasons. I think it's negative political reasons. She's a... Uh, She's a Democrat. I'm going to be nice. She's a Democrat. She's making a big mistake. People are dying in Chicago and other cities, and we can solve the problem. They have to ask us, but we can solve the problem. Why was it President Obama's fault in 2016? You credited it as because him. President involved. Obama was invited in, and he did a poor job. President Obama could have gone into Chicago. He could have solved the problem, and he didn't. In our case, they don't want us in. We can solve the problem very easily. We're equipped with the best equipment, the best people, and you see what we're doing. I mean, Portland was coming down. It was busting at the seams, and we went in and protected all the federal buildings. Those federal Portland was coming down. It was busting at the seams, and we went in and protected all the federal buildings. Those federal buildings are totally protected, but and we had to do that, and Portland's a very different place than Chicago, but Chicago should be calling us, and so should Philadelphia and Detroit and others to go in and really help them. Because when you're losing many people a weekend, many, many people, you see the same numbers as I do, when you're losing these people, they should call us and they should say, come on in. And it's incredible to me, but they're not doing it. At some point they will, at some point we may have no other choice but to go in. 
Jeff, please. Mr. President, are you looking at closing further Chinese embassies in the United States? And did you ask Ambassador Woody Johnson to bring the British open to your Turnberry or Turnberry property in Scotland? No, I never spoke to Woody Johnson about that, about Turnberry. Turnberry is a highly respected uh, course, as you know, one of the best in the world. And uh, I read I read a story about it today, and I had never I never spoke to Woody Johnson about doing that. No. Uh, as far as uh, closing additional embassies, it's always possible. You see what's going on. We thought there was a fire in the one that we did close. And everybody said, there's a fire, there's a fire. And I guess they were burning documents or burning papers, and I wonder what that's all about. Okay, how about one or two more, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, would you like to respond to Joe Biden, who today described you, you might have heard that, as the first racist to be elected president? That's, those are his, that was his words. Well, you know, it's interesting because we did criminal justice reform. We passed criminal justice reform, something that Obama and Biden were unable to do. Uh, we did uh, opportunity cities. We did the greatest. If, if you look at what we've done with opportunity zones, and nobody's ever even thought of a plan like that. Uh, prior to the China plague coming in, floating in, coming into our country and really uh, doing terrible things all over the world, doing terrible things, we had the best African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American, almost every group was the best for unemployment. The unemployment numbers were the best. Uh, you look at, so you look at employment, you look at opportunity zones, and maybe most importantly, when you look at criminal justice reform, you look at prison reform. I've done things that nobody else, and I've said this, and I say it openly, and not a lot of people dispute it. I've done more for black Americans than anybody, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. Nobody has even been close. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, that was a press conference, this one a little bit shorter than yesterday, a little less than 30 minutes there. And once again, no health officials uh, with the president. The president asked about that today, and he said he gets his briefings and he's presenting what he is getting to the public. Um, I would say today, when it came to the facts on the virus, it was more of the president cherry picking things. There were some outright falsehoods, but some of the other things were sort of cherry picked here, probably um, the most notable of uh, the outright falsehoods was this idea that he said a lot of people say that children do not transmit very easily. Well, first of all, the president doesn't define what children is here. There's a study from South Korea that children younger than 10 transmit to others much less often than adults do. That risk is not zero. The problem is children ages 10 to 19, they can spread the virus basically as least as well as adults do. So this is a real serious issue for middle and high school, and there's just um, a complete gloss over there uh, and, and, all, and sort of an, a non-acknowledgement uh, on that, though when pressed you heard a little bit there. Let me bring in Car 50 million coronavirus tests. That makes it the leader in the world with India coming in second. The president also adding that the test positivity rate has now declined to 8%, which he said is much better than before. As you mentioned, he addressed uh, the uh, spiking cases in the Sun Belt and said officials are working hard to get that under control. The president saying that there are multiple reasons for the spike in cases. Listen to what he said. There are likely a number of causes for the spike in infections. Cases started to rise among young Americans shortly after demonstrations, which you know very well about, which presumably triggered a broader relaxation of mitigation efforts nationwide and a substantial increase in travel also was a cause. Increased gathering on holidays such as Memorial Day, as well as young people closely congregating at bars and uh, probably other places, uh, maybe beaches. President Trump also sought today to draw a contrast with Democrats over policing, saying that he wants to support and honor police, while Democrats want to defund, defame, and abolish them. And the president at an East Room event announcing new partnerships between federal law enforcement and local law enforcement to try to combat some of the rising crime in cities across America. Great honor to be with you today. In the East Room today, President Trump announcing more federal assistance to local law enforcement, an expansion of Operation Legend into Chicago and Albuquerque. This rampage of violence shocks the conscience of our nation and 
We will not stand by and watch it happen. Can't do that. Operation Legend began in Kansas City after Missouri Governor Mike Parson requested federal help to quell growing crime there. It partners FBI, U.S. Marshals, DEA, and ATF agents with local law enforcement. The program is named for Legend Talaferro, a four-year-old boy who was killed by a stray bullet as he slept in his bed June 29. Legend's family joined the president at the White House today. The Legend's family, we cannot even begin to imagine your anguish and your sorrow, but we solemnly promise to honor Legend, and we will be fighting every day to save the lives of America's children. The DOJ will be sending more than 100 additional agents into Chicago and some 35 to Albuquerque to partner with local police. While of course, health experts from the very beginning of all of this have been saying uh, that people should be washing their hands. And, and finally, Wolf, I mean, the other thing that should be pointed out is that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks were once again not at this press conference with the president. He obviously wants to have this stage to himself. Uh, Dr. Fauci, we're told, uh, was not invited to yesterday's press conference, was instead at home uh, working on his pitching arm because he's going to be uh, pitching or throwing out the first pitch for the Washington Nationals tomorrow night. But Dr. Deborah Burks was apparently once again in the next room. Could it be easily joined the president and fielded some of these important scientific and public health questions? And instead of the president obviously not having all the facts and not all of the information to answer those sorts of questions, uh, he could have called on Dr. Burks to answer those those queries and he's just he seems to be resistant to doing that wolf yeah he's uh, very resistant he pointed out that uh, they're briefing me he said uh, dr burks dr fauci they're giving me everything they know uh and i come out and uh, report uh, tell everyone what's going on it's a very concise way he said of doing it uh, let me get dana bash into this conversation as well uh dana he was very determined that he was going to be running the show and, and and let the the medical and scientific experts stay behind the scenes that's right. And look, that was an important question from Caitlin. And the answer we got was that he wants to, that he, you know, he has enough information. But, you know, the reality is, take, for example, what the president said about children, that children uh, have strong immune systems and that they, uh, they aren't as susceptible, which is why he continues to push children to go into school for the schools to open, uh, didn't answer the question from John Carl specifically on what his strategy is. I should add that. Um, but if Dr. Burks were there, if Dr. Fauci were there, the obvious follow would have been, well, medical professionals, what is your opinion based on your degrees and based on your experience, uh, not based on what may be politically uh, proper if you're the president running for re-election? So that's just not possible in a situation like that, and it, it's not an accident. Um, the other thing I just want to say is on the notion of uh, mandating federal masks in federal buildings, my reporting, Wolf, is that, uh, according to some people I'm talking to, that there is a, a sector of Trump world that is pushing the president to do just that, to, not, to go beyond just the, doing the tweet uh, with the mask on to putting it in his pocket, as he's done now in uh, two consecutive press conferences, but not actually wearing it, but actually making a move. We don't know if he's going to do it. He suggested that it's something that's, that's really being um, considered. And lastly, I just want to just from a pure political lens that this is a president who is running for re-election that can't go on the campaign trail. And he is trying to find whatever means he can to turn this around for himself. And that is the forum that we just saw. I mean, period. The fact that he, yes, talked about coronavirus, but was very e eager to talk about issues that are more uh, advantageous for him. He thinks politically, like the law and order, a notion that he pushes and other things like that. Another reason why the president is doing these press conferences, because he... Now is the best time to get into a new knee... Slight chance of a storm tomorrow, uh, then small chances off and on the rest of the 10-day forecast, but mainly dry, unfortunately, highs 80s and 90s. And for peer and winter, here's your forecast for the next week and a half. Just slight chances of storms off and on, otherwise just hot and humid. And the number of cases. And Brett, today public schools in the small eastern Tennessee town of Alcoa reopened to some students. They're operating on a staggered schedule to deliberately keep class sizes small, about five students per teacher. That's down from the normal 20. Brett?
It's a big question for all parents. Jonathan, thank you. It's a question we are going to ask coronavirus response coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. She'll join us live from the White House. Thanks. This program. It's descriptions of the current state of these cities, Jonathan. No question, Chuck, and it's all about the politics. I mean, he's painting a very bleak uh, and dire picture of these American cities run by Democratic mayors. We heard him hit those talking points, frankly, a couple of times today, trying to portray these cities as, as lawless and needing federal assistance, which is clearly not meant to win many votes in cities like Portland and Chicago, Democratic strongholds, but to try to send a signal to suburban voters or senior voters who might be unnerved by uh, the descriptions that he's providing uh, and might want to choose a law and order candidate, which in that case would be President yeah. Trump. Uh, we certainly know, Chuck, we're not going to praise him for a change in tone. Uh, you know, we know that it's only a matter of time before it changes back. He's done this before. Uh, what he did do today, though, was stick to his talking points more than he usually does. Uh, so we can say that. Uh, and he clearly wanted to hit a few. And, and these were political points. They weren't just about the virus. It wasn't. And to Carol, to what Carol said is correct. He did seem a little more upbeat. He also stressed the economic recovery. Right. And, and as a final point, uh, we shouldn't overlook that because though that recovery is certainly fragile with these cases surging and right. the virus throughout the country, but his advisors say, look, the president's not going to have a shot at re-election if the economy doesn't continue to improve, if it doesn't pick up. Right. So, of course, he wanted to make sure to stress that with the eyes of the nation upon him. I think for what it's worth today, once again, felt more one, uh, like a political event in order to improve his own political standing than it was a general information event uh, for the general public. Uh, I need to give, we all need to give Ari his show, so I want to give Ari a show. Carol Lee, Jonathan Lemire, thank you. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you for working overtime for us. That's all we have here for a little bit of this overtime edition of Meet the Press Daily. But hey, the beat begins right now. Ari, take it away, sir. Yes, sir, Chuck, and I think we'll be helming some of this special coverage as the briefings continue, so always good to see you, sir. Yes. Nice to see you. I want to welcome you to the beat. I am Ari Melbourne. In a moment, we're going to bring in our expert medical guests to continue this special coverage. Let me just give you some of the facts. The United States has over 3.8 million virus cases and 143,000 deaths. A death toll in America that is surpassing now more than 1,000 people per day on Tuesday, a grim milestone to be sure. And it is, as you can see here, the first time that it's gotten back that high since late May. That one spike in between is when New Jersey was adding 2,000 probable COVID deaths, which had happened previously. That's what that blue line is. All of this following the rise in confirmed cases, while scientists note that mortality rates typically follow these case increases by about two weeks. Late today, the president gave this second COVID briefing of the week. That was after a three-month hiatus away from this. Now, as mentioned, and the president gave his explanation for this today, members of the medical task force were not in physical attendance in the room. So you have two days where the president is using this valuable time to give the updates. He explained, he says, that he is doing a, quote, concise presentation of what the medical experts say. But of course, it is a departure from what the administration used to do, which is have some of those medical experts say the things themselves. All of this comes against a clash with some of those very experts, including what has spilled out in public, sometimes what appear to be barbs or disagreements back and forth with the very famous Dr. Anthony Fauci. There was one other point we want to show you before we go to the experts, which was also a change. Listen to Donald Trump today during the briefing about masks. I think all is suggesting if you want to wear a mask, you wear it. I bring one. I have one. I've worn it. Uh, and I think when I'm in certain settings like hospitals and various or when I'm close, when you know, when you can't socially distance, I believe in it. Let's see. Do I? I do. I have it, and if, if you know, in certain in certain instances, I think you really, uh, I think you want to travel with a mask. As for Dr. Fauci, he is giving this warning. I don't see this disappearing, the way SARS one did. The reason I say that is that it is so efficient in its its ability to transmit from human to human that I think we ultimately will get control of it. I don't really see us eradicating it. Those are the words from the doctor and the president. And let's get right to it now with Bina Venkatram, an editorial page editor for the Boston Globe, who served. And then a series of metros that went down in a period of time, often two or three weeks apart. 
This time we saw wide virus spread across counties, across rural areas, across small metros and big metros, all the way across the south, southwest, and west, almost simultaneously. So this was an event that we think can be traced to Memorial Day and opening up and people traveling again and being on vacations. And we're really tracking this because where it hasn't happened yet is our Midwest and our Northeast that was so hard hit in March and April. What's, and so we're watching that very carefully. What's the top stat that you're following? You, what are you looking at day to day? The top statistic that you're looking at. So we send a report every week on Mondays to every single governor. It's about 10 pages per state. And it really goes into detail. What we think is the most sensitive indicator is what we call test positivity. And it only has to go up a tiny bit. So let's say you had 3% test positive, and then the next week you have 3.3%. That is one to start really watching. We think that's the earliest indicator. That's why we show that at county level, at metro level, at small cities and large metro areas, as well as the state level, so that every governor and every mayor and every health commissioner can really understand what we're seeing in their state and so that we can really provide recommendations to the states on how best to control this virus. Well, speaking of testing, the president mentioned it, but you were at over 50,343,000 tests. Uh, positive tests reported about 4,653,000. The percentage of positive tests, 9%. Here's the question, though, that we're getting a lot, and that is the time it takes to get the tests and the results from the test, if it takes one, two, three, even four days, what's the purpose of the test from a medical contact tracing possibility? So you're absolutely right. The turnaround times, particularly across the South, are too long. Um, we've been working at state by state levels to when the president talked about a change in strategy, really increasing our strategy. We, of course, have a testing strategy, but really to address these turnaround times will be absolutely critical. And then the most hardest hit states, they are having the longest turnaround times. How did this happen? Well, if you look right now, and you've had it on just before, we have three states that are equivalent to what the worst conditions were as far as number of tests required was New York. And we have three states approaching those case numbers. So now we need three times, really, the number of tests that we had before. And so we're really working to increase pooling. We know that can dramatically increase our throughput. Really, we need the Northeast and the Midwest that have those very low test positive rates to move to pooling so that those tests can be moved to the South, the Southwest, and the West. Just like early on, we shifted a lot of testing into the Northeast. We need the Northeast now to help us by doing pooling. They have test positivities often under 3%. We think they're in the perfect situation to combine three or four different tests into one tube to run it, and that increases our capacity by 4X. And so this is what we're really asking each of the states to work on, to do. We're asking the platforms, the Roche and LabCorp and Quest and other large commercial labs to really look at pooling in the Midwest and the Northeast so that we can make te more tests available to the South and the Southwest. But is it fa fair to say that that is a national failure, testing? Here, here back in March 13th, here's what, what we were saying back then. You were saying from, from uh, the briefings back then. Clients and patients and people that have interest can go, fill out a screening questionnaire. They would move down this and be told where the drive-through options would be for them to receive this test. The labs will then move to the high-throughput automated machines to be able to provide results in 24 to 36 hours. And that just did not materialize. How come? So that did materialize all through May and the first part of June and almost to the end of June. We had turnaround times in less than 24 hours to 48 hours when you include the fact that we had to ship the samples. So the drive-throughs were working, the pharmacies, and the, we had multiple sites across the United States. We had point of care available throughout the United States. But when you have this level of outbreak, and that's why I wanted to start that way, we have almost 70% of every parish in Louisiana with a test positivity above 10%. 
We have almost 65% of all the counties in Alabama and Mississippi. I was just in the field at all of these nine states with these recent outbreaks to really understand what they are facing. This is a very different epidemic than we had in March and April, and it will require additional tests. And so this surge and this degree of cases so widespread compared to previously does have to be addressed. I think that's what the president is talking about when he talked about yesterday, increasing our tests and having a strategy that surges tests into the areas so that we can really decrease those turnaround times. We know how important those are. We yeah. know how important it is for everybody to know immediately whether they're positive or not so they can be isolated and prevent further transmission. Dr. Burks, we have some specific tweets and Facebook posts from viewers. If you just have a couple more minutes on the other side of a break, we could ask those to you. Perfect. Okay, we'll see you in a, a little bit. Up next, uh, another big step backwards in the U.S. relations with China. But Dr. Burks is sticking around, and we have your questions coming up. Bully pulpit is to offer clear information about mm -hmm. what is advised, what kinds of actions are advised on the part of the American public. That is a role that the president can play. Although he was, but again, in fairness, he was mm -hmm. packing one. I mean, we had, we went months where he was even more confused and disparaged them, the Lone Ranger remarks, et cetera, you know, and now he's actually packing one into the room. Sure. I mean, it's a low bar, I think, to praise him for that, given that there have been Republican governors all around the country wearing masks for some time. There have been leaders of all parties, of all stripes, cultural leaders, political leaders, wearing masks for, for months now. So for the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, the largest economy in the world, the epicenter of biomedical innovation to put finally take a mask out, I think, yes, uh, sure, <laughs> we can say that's how, a good thing. Um, now, how low a bar would you say, like limbo level low? <laughs> how low can we go? Um, no, I think it's definitely a good thing. Look, let's not trivialize that it's important that the president still has support from some 38 percent of the public. And so if he can signal that it's important to wear a mask, if he could do so more strongly, that would certainly be in the interest of public health. So let's say that as Americans, we all hope that he'll continue to do better on these fronts. Of course, we heard reports that he went into a hotel that required masks, his own hotel, right. not wear a mask. So I think what's troubling is that, that the messaging is not clear. And I actually, in thinking ahead, as, as you mentioned in my book, I'm looking down the road to how the president's mixed messages on public health measures might affect and compromise the ability to get large swaths of the population to take a vaccine. Right. So if we're lucky enough to have an effective vaccine against right. COVID-19 that confers immunity in a population right. in terms of being safe and effective, people still need to be willing to take that. Right. And we know that there a, has been- I have to fit in a break because we have so much news coming out of Bar in Portland, but uh, your final thought there. I, I just hope that scientists and others do as much as they can in the process of getting to a vaccine to communicate with the public the risks, uh, the safety measures that have been taken in clinical trials, and to really to convey the importance of taking vaccines. Uh, and a, a fitting final thought there, Bina uh, Venkatraman, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. I hope you'll come back, Dr. Bedelia, who we see often, uh, unfortunately often with the tough news, but your clarity from both of you is really appreciated. Uh, let me tell viewers what's coming up, because we've had a little bit of Minnesota and Ohio all issuing statewide mask mandates today, and months into this now, President Trump, for a second day in a row, making the point that masks make a difference. Medics with the South Carolina National Guard called in to help five hospitals, now overwhelmed with patients in that state. Family heartbreak in Arizona tonight, a pregnant mother infected with the virus, dying while in labor, her final words, everything will be okay, take care of my son. The baby survived. And new concerns tonight about testing in black and Hispanic communities in parts of this country. Authorities say they are understaffed and have longer wait times. And the new study in the New England Journal of Medicine tonight on antibodies and how quickly they might fade after initial infection. ABC's Victor Kendo leads us off from Florida tonight. Tonight, coronavirus cases soaring to new records in California, surpassing New York State now with the most cases in the country four months into the pandemic. 60% of cases in Los Angeles County are among young adults. Officials fearing another stay-at-home order may be necessary. In fact, COVID-19 appears to be on track to becoming one of the leading causes of death in L.A. County. With the national daily death toll topping 1,000 for the first time in two weeks, more states are now making masks mandatory to try to stop the spread. The governors of Ohio, Indiana, and Minnesota 
joining a growing list of at least 31 states announcing new orders today. With this mask mandate and with the things that we have done previously to this, I think it is very possible for us to not have the darker days behind us, but for us to start moving forward. President Trump refusing to issue a nationwide mask order, holding a coronavirus briefing for the second day in a row, urging Americans... Wear a mask, socially distance, and repeatedly wash your hands. You have to do this. You have to just, you, you have to look at it differently. The president then making an appeal to younger Americans. We want young Americans to avoid packed bars and other crowded indoor gatherings, and we're all in this together. And as Americans, we're going to get this complete. We're going to do it properly. And 24 hours after the president said the virus would disappear, Dr. Anthony Fauci disagreeing. I don't see this disappearing. We are certainly not at the end of the game. I, I'm not even sure we're halfway through. Nine states setting records for hospitalizations, including Florida, where ICUs are filling up Hospitals are forced to find extra space for incoming COVID patients. So it's been a daily process of converting regular beds and Pfizer to provide 600 million doses. The companies have said that if their vaccine is proven safe and efficient, 100 million of those doses could be available by December. Nora? Manuel Bajorquez, thank you. Tonight, China is vowing to retaliate after the U.S. accused the country of hacking into companies doing coronavirus vaccine research and ordered its consulate in Houston to close. Now, this is a significant escalation in a growing conflict between the world's two largest economies, all made worse by the pandemic. Here's CBS's Margaret Brennan. Plumes of smoke tipped off firefighters that something was amiss at China's Houston consulate. When attempting to make entry, they were denied access to the facility. These images, which have not been verified, show people burning documents, a common practice when a diplomatic post is quickly abandoned. U.S. officials claim that Houston was a hub for espionage and that China recently escalated its theft of intellectual property from U.S. institutions. Hours earlier, the State Department ordered China's ambassador to shut down the Texas outpost by Friday. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We are setting up clear expectations for how the Chinese Communist Party is going to behave. And when they don't, we're going to take actions that protect the American people, protect our security, our national security, and also protect our economy and jobs. An outraged Beijing threatened there may be consequences for expelling dozens of its diplomats. Tensions with Beijing have escalated since the pandemic began. Kung flu is a nasty, horrible disease that should have never been allowed to escape China. And President Trump's long-promised trade deal has stalled. I'm not interested right now in talking to China. China claims it is all unfair stigmatizing for political reasons. Now, sources tell CBS News that China's espionage has gotten increasingly brazen at medical facilities and universities. Accredited Chinese diplomats have even gotten caught trying to sneak into military bases in Florida and Virginia and at Houston's airport carrying fake IDs trying to help Chinese nationals board a chartered plane. Nora? Pretty brazen. Margaret Brennan, thank you. Tonight, the mayor of Chicago is vowing to fight plans to deploy federal agents in her city. More on that in a moment. Some Chicagoans are saying they need the help, especially after 15 people were shot outside a funeral. So what's fueling this violence? Here's CBS's Jeff Begay's. Today, Chicago's top cop made a plea for the violence to stop. Put your guns so what used to take you maybe 10 to 14 days to develop now appears in 24 to 48 hours allows you to re-clear that virus. And so that's what happens with other viruses and other infectious diseases. I think the question about can you be reinfected, you know, we have a lot of cases out there and we have a lot of cases now over the last six months and we don't see this high level of reinfection. What assures me is we know that people, the majority of people around the world, once they're infected, they amount an immune response, both the, what we call the antibody response and the cellular response, and they clear the virus. That is the roadmap for vaccine development. That's the roadmap for monoclonal antibodies, for therapeutics. And I think that's what's so encouraging about this virus and our ability to clear it.
Two more things. One is the Washington, uh, the uh, New York Times had this massive piece in which um, they have this, this sentence. Inside the White House, Dr. Birx was the chief evangelist for the idea that the threat from the virus was fading. Did you read that piece and what did you make of it? So I, I'm a data person, so I went back to that very specific day. I um, report out the data every single day. So I went back to that day and I looked at my report. And my report started out with, we are seeing improvements in New York and New Jersey, but we're seeing increasing concerns and we're not at peak in Boston or Chicago. We have new concerns in Houston and we have new hotspots developing in Washington, D.C. and across the South. So to me, that's a very balanced report. That's what epidemiologists and data people do. They yeah. just put the data out there as it exists. Um, I was surprised by the piece because most people will tell you that um, I err on the other side, that I am too forceful and too direct often about the data and what it's showing. Um, and I've never actually been called uh, an optimist in that yeah. way before. So. Well, last thing, another po a report in a Washington Post piece said, Burks and others were frustrated with the CDC's antiquated system for tracking virus data, which they worried was inflating some statistics, such as mortality rate and case count, by as much as 25%. There's nothing from the CDC that I can trust, Burks said, according to two people. Is that true? And where do you think the CDC data is today? So those are two pieces put together. So what is CDC extraordinary about and what are we using every single day? Their surveillance data, their epidemiologic data, their laboratory data, and their integration of all of that data. And the analysts that are down there as epidemiologists and analysts that provide those reports, I rely on those. That data is all superb. That comment was about daily hospitalization data. When we were first trying to put out remdesivir, um, I, it's important to me that there's extraordinary equity in how we distribute medication when it's needed for really a very specific patient. And so we were having a really passionate and compassionate discussion about what's best for patients. And we were talking about the hospital data and the importance of daily complete reporting. And that's what we were talking about is the hospital data specifically. The epidemiology data, the surveillance data, the influenza-like illness surveillance data, the emergency room syndromic management surveillance, all terrific, critical. And it's not just the data, it's the people they bring to the table to analyze it. Dr. Burks, we kept you too long. Please tell the White House we apologize, but we appreciate your time, and you're welcome back anytime because our viewers have a lot of questions, as you can imagine. Thank you. All Great right. to see you. Up next, another big step backwards in U.S. relations with China. For all? Federalism. The idea is typically that the states and local governments have the authority to handle their own problems internally without resort to the federal government unless they want that oversight. Professor, I'm old enough to remember in law school when they teach you that it's a traditionally conservative value to defer uh, to local authorities. Well, I, again, that's the point. Um, the idea of sending in the federal government unilaterally would be for, I think, many who consider themselves conservatives or libertarians, the kind of tyrannical federal intervention that the Constitution would prohibit or certainly frown hmm. upon. Hmm. Um, we always end uh, a little more informed. Professor Murray, uh, appreciate you giving us some time in your class tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, now, it's... it's of Portland as a result of this federal action. That's what we call tyranny and dictatorship. And we are not having it in Chicago. And David, that shooting outside of this funeral home behind me here is just the latest in a sharp increase of violent crime here in Chicago. Murders are up 51% compared to last year. The feds insist they're coming in to help with that problem, not to silence protesters. David? All right, Alex Perez tonight from Chicago. Thanks, Alex. And now to that alarming new headline at Fort Hood, Texas. For the third time in a month, the body of a soldier from the base has been found nearby. Here's ABC Stephanie Ramos on this again tonight. Tonight, the Army revealing an investigation is underway into the death of a Fort Hood soldier found near the Texas Army base, the third time in a month. Private Mahor Morta was found Friday at a reservoir minutes away from the post. Hunter Prophet served with him in Georgia. We hung out and did a lot of things, and then I see this thing come up last night from a lot of my battle buddies. They're like, 
Morda never did anything to anybody. On June 19th, the remains of Private Gregory Weedle Morales were discovered after he was last seen in August 2019 outside the base. His mother grieving for him and now the Mortas. We're just now getting Gregory back to, the, to Oklahoma. I hope they get answers faster. The remains of Specialist Vanessa Guillen were found June 30th after she vanished from the base in April. Authorities allege another soldier killed and buried her. He killed himself after police confronted him. A civilian who authorities say helped him dispose of her body has pleaded not guilty to conspiracy to tamper with evidence. A Fort Hood spokesperson tells me Private Mortis had been missing for a day before he was found. Authorities say a preliminary autopsy ruled his death a drowning. David. All right, Stephanie Ramos, Steph, thank you. Overseas tonight, new questions about whether President Trump pressured the UK to move the famed British Open to his resort in Scotland. ABC News confirming tonight Ambassador Woody Johnson allegedly told colleagues the president asked him to convince the British government to make the move. Here's our White House correspondent, Rachel Scott, tonight. Tonight, new questions about whether the president tried to convince the UK to move the British Open to his Turnberry Golf Resort in Scotland. Everybody comes here. They all want to come to Turnberry. The New York Times reports that in 2018, the president's ambassador to the UK, billionaire Woody Johnson, told multiple colleagues Trump pressured him to try and make the move happen. Johnson's former deputy, Louis Lukens, tells ABC News he warned the ambassador it would be unethical for the president to use his office for personal profit. Lukens says Johnson still pitched the idea to Scotland's Secretary of State David Mundell. A spokesperson for the British government says that conversation never happened. No, I never spoke to Woody Johnson about that, about Turnberry. Turnberry is a highly respected uh, course, as you know, one of the best in the world. But the president has not been shy about using his stature to promote his own properties. Just last year, he chose his Doral Resort in Miami to hold the G7 summit. We have a series of magnificent buildings. We call them bungalows. They each hold from 50 to 70 very luxurious rooms with magnificent views. Eventually facing withering criticism, the president reversed course. David, tonight the ambassador to the UK, Woody Johnson, is also under fire, accused of making racist and sexist remarks. One report claiming he said he prefers to work with women because they are cheaper and work harder than men. Tonight, Johnson is denying those allegations. David? Our White House correspondent, Rachel Scott, tonight. Rachel, thank you. When we come back, the Sup that win Simon at a recent outburst, his wife Kim Kardashian West goes public over his struggles with mental illness. Later, he saved a life with an amazing catch. Now, a lot of lives are about to be changed in his very name. It's about the humans. These humans. Those long overdue. This week, the Justice Department accused two Chinese government-backed hackers of targeting coronavirus researchers across the U.S., including an engineering firm in Texas. Forcing a foreign government to shut a consulate is an extraordinary diplomatic step. In this case, in a relationship that has deteriorated rapidly since the coronavirus pandemic, China's government calls the closure outrageous. China strongly condemns it and urges the U.S. side to withdraw the wrong decision. Otherwise, China will definitely take necessary and legitimate response. That likely means closing one of the five U.S. consulates in China. Because of the coronavirus, the State Department had brought many of its diplomats in China back to the U.S. Over the past few weeks, they were slowly returning to China. Secretary Pompeo is returning from Europe, the latest of several administration officials to consult with allies recently on confronting China's government. Pompeo says he hopes... You are not an animal. Make the smart choice. In two. They are the current generation, demonstrated by town teams across the state, future and past major leaguers. Maybe a belly laugh at an ump who wore outrageously colored uniforms or gut busting giggles from an old. Diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. will not survive. The doctor came to me and he said, Mom. Bob, a modern approach to wealth management movements of the day, Black Power, Black Panthers, which Nixon felt compelled to fight back against. Thinly veiled racial appeals. Talking about crime, by talking about law and order, or the chaos of our urban cities, unleashed by the civil rights movement.
Now that there is expertise on the history, but I want to share with you tonight, it is backed by some of the very people involved. A top Republican Nixon aide later admitted, recounting how the Nixon campaign had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people, by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, end quote. That confession right there is deep. A Nixon aide admitting, one, the political plan was to mobilize their side by going after their opponents on the left and in the black community, and then turning government powers to dial up a drug war to arrest and jail them. Now, that's plenty. But here's part two of that confession. Did we know we were lying about the drugs, he asked? Of course we did. A government abusing law and order to get power while claiming it's the guardian of law and order. Well, you can see the echoes here. Tonight, many mayors and many Trump critics argue that's exactly what his administration is doing now. But when it comes to voters, it's still an open question whether these tactics will work as they have in the past. And here's why. Right now, the surging support for the Black Lives Matter movement has skyrocketed in the wake of these protests since George Floyd's killing. The percentage of voters also who now think that black Americans face discrimination, you can see from 2008 to 2020, has doubled. Americans now say they see systemic racism in a new way. And this brings us, of course, back to the protests, back to the thing that, according to these mayors and critics, Donald Trump is trying to squelch. Here's how Reverend Al Sharpton, who is both a colleague but also has been working on these issues for decades, here's how he put it at the Floyd funeral, discussing what the law means and why it needs equality. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country, in education, in health services, and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. That's unacceptable. Breast cancer is the leading cause of all. Number two, Chelsea on a break after a nice throw in and Callum Hunt. Three, his daughter says he was a dedicated father, grandfather, part. We'll talk about your weekend in just a few minutes. Kill. Conversation with anyone and make them feel important. Alicia Chenot de Bulate of Washington, D.C. was 91. She was a renowned psychiatrist and the oldest faculty member at Howard University. She also was a civil rights advocate. My name is Buckets, and you can always recognize me because I'm the clown that has a bucket on his head. I really just try to interact with the kids different types of ways, you know, uh, high fives, for example. The power of a high five is awesome. Let's go, let's go. Yeah. Let's go, let's go. The coronavirus pandemic has affected all of us, and the world of sports is no different. While things are going to look and feel a little different this season, we're happy to say, after 133 days, Twins baseball is back on Fox Sports North. 